Okay. And then when we come out, all, what I'll do is I'll ask Karen out here about mm -hmm. about her faith, and if she can give a testimony, she will. And then we'll baptize, and then we'll go there in the fountain. Okay. And okay, we'll do that afterwards. Hopefully gotcha. Hopefully, I'll be back. But yep. And yep. Okay. I saw him taking his wet clothes off. It's a little difficult. Yep. Um, yeah, let's try a little bit of there in the fountain.
Good morning, friends, and welcome to the YouTube ministry channel of Williamstown First Baptist Church in Williamstown, Massachusetts. This ministry is dedicated to preaching the undiluted Word of God, to Christian love and charity, and to heartfelt and enlightening praise and worship. We're glad you could join us this morning, and we look forward to the day when we can all gather once again to savor the sweet fellowship of the saints. In the meantime, we encourage you to reach out to us if you need prayer, counsel, or just wish to engage in a discussion about the truth and worth of the Bible and the Christian worldview. Just look for our contact information in the description box for this video. And now, here's Pastor Chuck St. John. Well, good morning, and good to have you all with us this morning as we celebrate a wonderful experience in someone's life. The Lord's blessing of Karen's life will be celebrating with a baptism at, after the service is concluded and after our YouTube broadcast is concluded. But we will be talking about baptism uh, during the service in today's message. Uh, before I get to that, just wanted to make a note that uh, we've decided we're going to hold off on our annual meeting for a couple of months. Uh, the reason being is in trying to pull everything together, we're still dealing with absent people because of vaccine and COVID, and we're hoping that within the next few months uh, that all of that will come together, and ideally we would be able to at least be outside on the lawn afterwards, um, and perhaps I really would like a potluck, but we'll do what's safe. So we'll be moving that. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Uh, at that time, we will be welcoming Karen into membership at a formal meeting. And if anyone else is interested, please let myself or Carl know, and we'll begin those conversations as well. But... As I said, we'll be celebrating a baptism. As you can see, I'm down a little bit lower. The font is open behind me. Uh, praise God. It's one of the great times in a Christian's life when God has begun a work. And our call to worship reflects that. It's from the book of Acts. Uh, Philip, uh, the evangelist, had been told to leave Samaria where there was a revival going on and go down into the desert. God had an appointment for Philip down in that desert uh, with an Ethiopian official, a eunuch. And the eunuch welcomed him into his carriage. And Philip told him about Jesus Christ. And this is a portion of that passage. Then Philip told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And we'll be asking those here and those listening, what prevents you? What has prevented you from following our Lord's command to be baptized? Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for this opportunity to celebrate your work in a life. We pray your blessing this morning on all that we do. May it honor Christ, proclaim him, praise him. We pray that your spirit would guide our words, our thoughts, our exclamations, that you would inhabit them, that you would protect us from Satan and anyone who would disrupt this. We pray your blessing on Karen's life as she comes forward that you would open her mouth to sing your praises, and we'll be grateful this morning, Lord, to hear from your word and from our Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And please stand, and we'll praise our God. Good morning, church. As I walked in this morning and I saw the, the pool of water there, my initial instinct was to want to check the chlorine. I'll be doing that soon enough at home, I guess. You know, I love that section of the book of Acts that is our call to worship this morning. I want you to think about something, though. When the Ethiopian eunuch comes back up out of the water after being baptized, do you know what happens next? 
Philip goes poof. Philip just disappears. And this is, this is written without any fanfare, without any, any flowery language, language, just matter-of-factly. Just matter-of-factly, a human being disappears from sight. Wow! Think of the amazing supernatural spiritual power that is manifested by a human being just going poof. And I believe, dear friends, that that was done to show us the magnificent spiritual supernatural power that occurred just before the poof when the Ethiopian eunuch became one with his God. Hallelujah. We all have that opportunity. We all have that ability to become one with our God in an amazing supernatural act. So we rejoice for and with Karen this morning. And we proclaim to our God that he has made us glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the lord we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord and we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice. He has made me glad, he has made me glad, 
He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for He has made me glad. Amen. And please be seated, and we'll pray for a moment. One of the benefits of uh, participating in and praising God for baptism is it reminds each of us of the day in which we were baptized and we celebrated God's initial work in our lives. And it's a reminder of the call of God upon our lives and our profession of faith at that time included a profession of our desire to follow him. And so it's a reminder of that profession and it enables us to look back and compare our lives to that profession. Have we indeed followed the Lord? And so it's a blessing to God's church. It's a reminder that everything begins with God, everything is for God, and everything is for His glory. And so while we be praying for Karen, we'll be praying for ourselves, we'll be praying uh, for other churches in the area that are baptizing churches that be believe in a profession of faith as being necessary for baptism, that we would live up to that and we will pray for the people in America that they would do the same. Uh, we do have, of course, other prayer requests. Uh, as we always mention, please keep all of those in mind. Uh, please, of course, keep the town family in mind as they deal with a number of things, uh, and we'll be grateful for that. Uh, Pete and Barb, good to see Barb as well, and so continuing to pray. Uh, praying for students at every level, not just uh, college students, but young people as well as uh, we all begin to go back to regular activities, uh, whether it's celebrating, whether it's classes, uh, pray that God would bless and protect, protect teachers, professors, uh, grant wisdom uh, to everybody involved in those decisions. Uh, we'll pray for that as well. I uh, want to pray for our government officials, that they would be wise, that they would seek God's counsel and lead us in it. I want to pray for pastors and preachers, again, as we always do this week in particular for Ray Monroe and Blackington Union over in North Adams that God would bless the messages there and bless the heart of the pastor to be drawn to the Word of God to proclaim it. Uh, pray for our shut-ins. We've all been shut in now, more or less, for the last year. And we ought to have more empathy for those who are there by physical necessity. And so we'll pray for them. And, you know, we've been blessed, as we've always said, a number of you write cards as part of your ministry, and it's been a blessing. And so we want to praise you for that and encourage all of us to do the same, to remember those who cannot be out and amongst us uh, in lives that were once normal. And for them, they will not return to a time when they can be out, at least in this world. So let's bow our heads. Father, we do give you great praise for the work in our lives. None of us would be here if you had not done that initial work. Uh, we celebrate it today in an individual's life, but we celebrate it in our own as well. It's a reminder, Lord, that as with Israel, it's not because of our wisdom, not because of our greatness, or our holiness, for we, like Israel, have been, are, and always will be a stubborn people, insisting on our own way, frequently neglecting those things that you've called us to do, and yet you saved us because of your great mercy and because of your great love. And you called us to be light and salt and ambassadors in this world to tell others about you, to encourage them to follow you, not just by our words, but by our actions, by our lifestyles, by our reactions to pain and to hurt, to illness, to sickness and to death, to proclaim Christ as overcomer, 
of all that besets this world, beginning with sin. Forgive us that we have failed many times. We have returned to those things of which we are mostly ashamed to find comfort or solace, and we have not turned to you. Help us to turn to you, Lord. In those times of depression or illness or weariness, and then lift us by your Spirit. Help us, Lord, to look behind us and to see goodness and mercy pursuing us all the days of our lives. Your mercy and goodness. Help us, Lord, to fall on our knees and say thank you. We pray for pastors in this land that they would proclaim Christ crucified. They would not succumb to the pressure of preaching a cultural message of good feeling and good intention, but indeed one of deep humility before the cross of Christ for every person who desires to be saved, a recognition that we cannot save ourselves. Bless the leaders in this country, our civic leaders, with a humility as well that seeks your wisdom and does not rely on their own. Because we know that you, Lord, are the beginning of all wisdom. And apart from you, we have none. All we have is knowledge. And we don't have the slightest idea how to employ it in the best possible way. We pray particularly for Ray Monroe, for his ministry, that you would bless him, that you would pour out your spirit on him and on Blackington Union, that you would bring a revival and awakening in that place once more as we witnessed 20 years ago. We pray for Eva, for Nancy, for Laura, for Mary, for Helen, for Dave, for Nancy, for Melanie, for Mary, for Flora, for Chubby. We pray for all these who are shut in, unable to be about. Comfort them by your presence. Surround them with your love. Help us to reach out to them, whether by call or whether by card, to let them know that they are not forgotten, either by God or by us. And Father, do bless uh, the words that we say here this morning and the words that we sing. May they honor you. May they find their source in you. And may you bless them so that as they go into this world, they would reap a harvest of righteousness in the hearts of all who hear. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And please stand and we'll praise our God more. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, Thy presence, my light. Be Thou my wisdom, and Thou my true word. I ever with me, and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou with me dwelling, and I with thee one. Which is I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and Thou only, first in my heart. I, King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. 
my King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Thou art exalted far above 
all gods I exalt thee I exalt be seated and please turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 11. And let me read that for us and encourage you to read along and then we'll pray and we'll pray that God blesses us this morning and Paul in this letter has been talking about the dilemma that we all face that we're all sinners and that because of Christ we now have life and he's talking now in this section about how we should live now that we have been saved what shall we say then? Chapter 6, verse 1. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Father, as always, need your help to proclaim this text accurately, understandably, meaningfully, 
And we pray that your spirit would do so now. Take these next moments, explain this text to us, apply it to our hearts. And we pray that everyone who hears this message will be changed. If they have been baptized, they'll rejoice and remember your work. If they have not been baptized and they know you, we pray that you will grant them great conviction that they would seek to do so as soon as possible. And for those who do not know you, we pray, Lord, that you do that work in their lives that you have done in Karen's and that you have done in each of ours. And bring us, bring us, Lord, to a place of living for our Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So you would think, being the pastor of a Baptist church, it would be easy to preach about baptism. Right? (laughs) And it's amazing to me in these last weeks in particular, for some unknown reason, I've been, in the last few months actually, participated in conversations uh, with other pastors about what exactly is baptism and who should be baptized. And of course, these discussions go way back. Hundreds of years ago, there was this group of people who had the temerity to look at Scripture in the original text in the Greek. And at that time, of course, everything was the Roman Catholic Church, and that was essentially synonymous with the government. And you became part of the government and part of the church by getting baptized as a child. Well, these folks had the temerity to look at Scripture and read what we're reading and say, wait a minute, we're not supposed to be baptized until we believe. And so they went out and they couldn't find anybody who would baptize them, so they baptized themselves and they were called Anabaptists. Baptizers again for a second time. And they were persecuted for that belief. They were killed. And so it's a question of Scripture and a question of what you see in Scripture and whether or not you're willing to follow Scripture or not. So are we supposed to baptize? Yes. How do I know that? Well, whenever anyone asks me a question, I refer to Scripture. I say, if you believe that, you show me where it says that in the book. Because if you can't show me, then it's simply man's opinion. And one opinion is as good as another. And even in my life, my opinion has changed. And so we ought not rely on man's opinion or man's practice or man's culture or man's rights we need to rely on scripture and at some point in each one of our lives we will be called by God to compare what we're doing in whatever tradition we are to a source of truth and this book claims to be the truth the only truth and I subscribe to that belief That doesn't make it true because I subscribe to it. It's true, and therefore I subscribe to it. And so where do I find it demanded that we baptize? Well, Jesus himself, the very last words that he spoke, Gospel of Matthew, very last chapter, the very last two verses. Jesus came and said to them, said to the disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always 
to the end of the age. And so yes, Jesus himself told the church. There's only one verb there, make disciples. How do you do that? Baptizing and teaching. And that's what we're supposed to do. And that's what we endeavor to do here. We teach the word of God. That's how we disciple. We encourage you all to live according to that word. And you all are the ones who bring people into the church to hear that word, to be saved, sanctified, converted. All of us as Christians have the responsibility of seeking others and declaring to them the truth. I have a job here in this place. We all have the same job out there. To live for Jesus, to speak of Jesus, to tell others of Jesus, and not to contradict what we do, what we say by what we do. And so we come to this word, yes, we're supposed to baptize. What does that mean? Does that mean that you should plunge someone in a tank or a river or a pond? Or is it enough to sprinkle? The word in the Greek means to immerse. And as we'll see, the analogy that God uses is, lends itself to that Greek word. Life and death, burial and resurrection. You've not seen anyone, unless it was the guy who invented the hokey pokey, they could, got all his left foot in, but they had his right foot out. You don't see someone sticking out of the grave. They're immersed. They're baptized. And so that's what the word means. Jesus was saying, go, make disciples, immersing them. And so that is in Matthew. So Paul comes to the question about sin and lifestyle, and he's going to use baptism in order to explain why they needed to live a new life. And with that, we have an explanation of what baptism is. And so the first two verses in Romans, what shall we say? Shall we continue to live in sin? Whoa, I've done some new things today. Should we continue to live in sin that grace may abound? No, God was a forgiving God. Some people were saying, well, if God's going to forgive us, we might as well just go and sin. He'll have more to forgive us for, and that'll give glory to his name. They say, well, that is really dumb. And that's what Paul says, by no means. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live with it? Okay, where did we die to sin? Verse 3, don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. And the sense of the words there are something that happened to you one time in the past. It's not a continuation. It happened once. It happened to you in the past. It's not something you did. It's a passive verb. It's something that happened to you. What was that? Well, John the Baptist promised what it was, first of all. John, in explaining to those around him, John the Baptist was baptizing. But it was a baptism unto repentance. The people were coming and they were saying, yes, we recognize our need to repent. And so we're going to be baptized to indicate that we're cleansing ourselves. We're going to walk now in a new life. And he said this, he said to the people that were sent to him, I baptize you with water. But see, water can't change your heart. You'll be back. And in fact, people were. Because in and of ourselves, we cannot change what we do. We remain sinners. As we saw a couple weeks ago, as we looked in Corinthians, we saw God has to change our hearts. And John basically says the same thing. He says, I baptize with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, Jesus, 
the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He will baptize you. Active verb. You. Passive receiver. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus described it as being born again. He said, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. When the Spirit comes into your life, when Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Spirit, when he sends the Spirit into your life, you are born again. You were dead in trespasses and sins, but by grace, God reached in, saved you, gave you life, gave you faith to believe, gave you a desire for his word, you can't get enough of it, gave you new passions, new desires in total. He made you new. Because now the Spirit is within you, guiding your heart, guiding your mind, guarding everything you do. And you can't help yourself. You want to be in church. You want to worship. You want to be with God's people. You can't help yourself. You want to be with family, and we're all made one by the Spirit in the body of Christ. We are the family of God. And so John promised it. Jesus described it. And Peter proclaimed it. After Jesus was crucified, rose, and ascended, Peter says this to the people. This is his very first sermon. He says, this Jesus, same Jesus, this Jesus, the Nazarene, the carpenter, the one you crucified, God raised up, and of that we are witnesses. I'm not giving you hearsay. I saw the man with the scars. With the nail prints, I saw Jesus risen. We are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, because when Jesus ascended, he now sits at the right hand of God, and we're told from there he'll come again. Being exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, and so the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father working in unison in this have determined in long time past that what would happen is that the Son would come and would die for our sins and then he would direct the Holy Spirit into the lives of those that he was saving. And so when your heart has been touched by the Spirit, when you have been born again, when you have been baptized by God. You have been blessed by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so that's why we baptize, as Jesus said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Because the three are one and are in agreement. And so baptism is something that happens to me. It happens to me. And not only was I baptized, therefore, the signif significance of that is that the old self, the old Chuck, now ceases to exist. Buried, if you will. Significance of baptism as we demonstrate it. God is a great teacher. He uses all kinds of analogies to teach his children the truth. All you have to do is look at what Jesus did. He was a master at stringing together parables and talking about lost sheep and prodigal sons in memorable ways. And it's a continuation of what we saw in the Old Testament, where Ezekiel, where Jeremiah were told to depict what God was trying to say to the people of Israel. 
The Passover meal is a meal of remembrance. We do it so that we remember what God had done. Circumcision is a memorial action. We remember what God did. He promised Abraham he was going to bring a seed that would bless all the nations. The Lord's table is a memorial meal. God gave us institutions, gave us these to remember his work. Baptism reminds us that it's God who baptized me and gave me new life. I didn't do it myself. And so I have nothing to be proud of. And that's important. If you think for one minute that you did any little thing that made you better than the next person, and that's why God chose you, you are not walking in faith. If you think because you went to church, if you think that you get baptized and that will save you, you are mistaken. No action on our part has any value to God if it is not done in his spirit, to his glory, at his prompting. You say, wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to get baptized. Yes. But how many young people do you know, because of the motion of the moment, think they ought to get baptized? Oh yes, all my classmates, I should get baptized. And they do. Unless God has baptized you in the spirit first, baptism in water has no meaning. And how can I tell if God has baptized you in the Spirit? By your lifestyle. Because, as we're told here, if you've been raised to new life, you should be living differently. You should be watching different shows. You should be using different language. You should be a different person. What God has done, he buried me, he raised me. Verse 6, chapter 6, verse 4, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too might walk in newness of life, making what Paul says understandable. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. See, and if we were anywhere but New England, you all would be shouting and jumping up and down because that's the best news I ever heard in my life when the Lord got hold of me. You mean that guy that did all that is gone, is dead, is passe? Praise God. You mean you give me new passions? I can see it, Lord. I get up in the morning and I... I want to read your word. I can see it in what I watch and what I laugh at now. The jokes I used to laugh at, jokes I used to tell. I'm a good Irishman. I don't laugh at them. I don't tell them anymore. Not because I'm trying not to. Because something inside me has made them wrong. Uncomfortable mistaken. And so God changed me. And so he has raised me just as he raised Christ up. He raised me now to new life. And the fact that he raised me here to a new life is a promise that on the day that he returns, he will give me eternal life. He'll resurrect me and bring me to heaven with him. And that's why Paul talks in Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul says in verse 5, If we have been united with him 
in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And since we live a new life in this world, the blessing is that we are freed from sin. Mary and Joseph were told that you'll call his name Jesus, you'll save his people from their sins. You know, we take that as meaning ultimately, I'll go to heaven, Jesus died in my place, okay. Well, yeah, that's true, but he saves us now from our sins. The things we do now that are opposed to his will, he enables us by that spirit with which he baptized us so that we can do all things through Christ. It's the Spirit of Christ. And so now I have no excuse. If before, as a husband, I said, no, no, that's woman's work. No man here ever said that, I'm sure. I know because you're still alive. (laughs) Christ says, I washed my disciples' feet. Go and do likewise. Christ says, the Son of Man came to serve. Go. Love one another as I have loved you. We're freed from our sins. That thing, you know, we pick the big ones. Liquor, women, drugs. He saved me. He freed me from those. I don't have to do that anymore. We know of people who have been freed. But how about pride? How about anger? How about wrath? How about an uncontrollable spirit? He saves us from sin, all sin. From sloth. From dishonesty. From covetousness. All sin. He saves us. We're freed from that. And so, Paul says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. And if you want to know if somebody is saved, if you want to know that Jesus baptized them with the Spirit, you watch them, you'll know them by their fruits. If they once had thorns and briars and now they have apples and oranges and mangoes. Something happened. And that's the idea. People look at us and they say, you're a sweet guy now before you were a jerk. What happened? And we tell them, I met Jesus. Jesus changed me. He saved me. We tell them. We tell them. And so God has done all of this for us spiritually. He's baptized us. He's raised us. I have it on the bulletin, actually. He will resurrect us, and he has freed us all spiritually, and baptism that we do now that Jesus commanded as an illustration of all that I've just said is why we do it. And even if I didn't know why, I'd still do it because Jesus commanded it. I should have had the same, I should have the same attitude as Eve should have had in the garden. Why shouldn't I eat that apple? It looks good. It looks like it tastes good. Why shouldn't I eat? that apple. Not a very satisfying answer, as most kids and their parents say, because I said so. God is the one that tells us what's good and what's bad. And when we decide we know better, we put ourselves in jeopardy. Just look at Adam and Eve. And so God has done all this. And so, you know, my question then to you as I said at the beginning, is the same as it was to the eunuch 
Or as the eunuch asked Philip, what prevents me from being baptized? What prevents you from being baptized if you have not? If you have not been baptized and you say that you believe in Jesus Christ, why not? Why not? Mark says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. The Philippian jailer in Acts 16, when he says to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And he was baptized at once. The eunuch here, what prevents me from being baptized? If you believe, then you can and should be baptized. And so, the eunuch stops his chariot. This is a guy now. Can you remember the, think of a president with his motorcade and all his entourage. He asked this fellow who's on the side of the street, can you help me understand this? And the fellow says, listen, this is Jesus this book is talking about. And one of the things it says you should do is be baptized. Can you imagine the President of the United States stopping by the Delaware River or anywhere in Washington? And they go down into the water and he gets baptized. That's the size, that's the importance of this person. That's the decision he made. He did not care what people thought. Oh, well, that's above, I'm... I'm an important person. Can we do this in private somewhere? No. Didn't matter if there was one person or a thousand. I need to be baptized. Here's water. Here's water. <laughs> Dare I say, if God is moving you to be baptized, then you come here this morning and profess your faith in Jesus, and we will baptize you. What prevents you from being baptized? Because Jesus has commanded it. And if he has commanded it, and if you do believe, if you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, there is the Spirit inside of you who's saying, listen to what he's saying. Listen, he's, he's got a rope and he's dragging you, and you're sitting there and you're fighting it. Say, no. Be baptized. Then be baptized. If Jesus baptized you, then you should be baptized to declare that truth to others. And the other thing that you should do is to testify to it by living a new life. 6 verses 8 through 11. If we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin. Died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, alive to God in Jesus Christ. And so when God gets a hold of you, when Jesus sends his spirit into your heart, you won't be able to help yourself if it's not today, it'll be tomorrow because the Spirit will tell you, be baptized. Live a holy life. And every time you veer off the path, He, through loving discipline, will bring you back. And so, if you believe it's a gift of God, therefore act on it. Act on it. Trust that the God who saves you will bless whatever you do. Every time you do something that God tells you to do, he draws you closer. You have a closer relationship. He blesses you with a knowledge of him that you did not have. Every time that you push him away, stand away, walk away, just as with a person, just as with a husband and wife, or with your kids, or with a friend, no, I can't do that. And you back away and you walk away. You miss 
an opportunity to develop a relationship with that person. And as you struggle against God, you miss the opportunity to develop a relationship with the living God. If he is calling you, if he has called you, submit your will, your pride. Submit, be baptized, live as he is calling you. Believe, 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 and be baptized. Please, for for God's sake, (laughs) for God's sake, believe and be baptized. Let's bow our heads. Father, well, we thank you for an opportunity again to be reminded, Lord, of one of the tenets of your faith. And we pray that this has been meaningful this morning and helpful and that you will bless the words to all that hear and indeed call people to believe and be baptized that your name might be honored. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And please stand, and we'll praise our God. the blood nothing but the 
blood Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for this. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to be a part of work that you're doing in someone's lives. And we do pray a blessing on Karen, pray a blessing on all those here as we witness it, that we'll be blessed by your spirit, uh, lifted, encouraged. Uh, Father, we're just very grateful. And we do pray for Karen that you'll bless her life, that you'll make her a continuing testimony to your work. We pray that you give her words to explain what's happened to her family, to her friends. Uh, who will wonder. Uh, We pray that you'll give us words to explain what we've attended today and what meaning there is to it. And we pray that you would pour out your spirit in this area, that you would bring many people to a confessing faith in you and to the waters of baptism, uh, that Christ's name might be magnified in this town and in this area by a work that you are doing. And may we always remember it's your work, not ours, and give you glory for it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. And have a good week. And that will conclude our YouTube uh, broadcast, but we invite you who are here to be seated. And 